to Soft Cover. Today, we're joined by Faranaz Ispahani, a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a steering group member on the International Parliamentarians Panel for Freedom of Religion or Belief. She's been a leading voice for women and minorities' rights in Pakistan for the last 25 years. And today, she's joining us to discuss her latest edited work, a book called The Politics of Hate, Religious Majoritarianism Across South Asia. Here's the book. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Isbani. Thank you, Vantana, for having me on. This book of 11 essays explores the various trends of um, rising religi religious majoritarianism across um, South Asia, especially in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. So to start us off, um, how do you compare what's happening in South Asia with trends of religious intolerance in the West? What is uniquely South Asian about this phenomenon? Okay. Um, well, I'll start off with um, three basic points on the politics of hate. Mm -hmm. There is indeed a global phenomenon of majoritarianism. It is rooted in politics. It is convenient for some politicians to whip up emotions among the majority as a means of succeeding politically. Mm. They do that by creating the sense of an other. Yeah. So there's an otherization of the minority. In South Asia, it is more religion-based. In Europe and, and America, it is primarily race-based. And in South Asia, we see it as more religion-based. So all, all together, what we're seeing in South Asia, is it does not always come naturally to people to think of others' religions negatively unless someone points it out to them. And that is what we're seeing right now, the phenomenon of the politics of hate. But the difference between South Asia and the West, I would say, is race versus religion primarily. Right. Uh, actually, several essays in this book talk about the South Asian obsession with demographics. And the first essay in this book, Hussain Akani's essay, talks about this otherization um, that, ha that happens now almost like politically in South Asia. Is it because South Asian society is so stratified that it's easier to do this? I don't think it's because of stratification. I think in the case of South Asia, the phenomenon of religion-based authorization can be primarily traced back to the partition of the subcontinent. Because of that um, breaking up of the subcontinent, religion became the main factor, especially in both India and Pakistan. The minority was built up as a threat to the majority's way of life, its mm -hmm. economic uh, opportunities, uh, you know, it became a very threat, the minority to the very existence of the majority, which is so unnatural because the minority cannot really override the majority. But this is the argument that since partition has been sold by those people, and it was at times it was... Uh, in Pakistan, it took root very early. Mm. In India, it's taken root later. In Sri Lanka, it started out as being race-based, yes. Tamil versus Sinhala, but now it's become Buddhist versus everyone else. So um, if the what we're seeing today, though, all over South Asia and why South Asia matters is the size of the population of South Asia, number one, is not negligible. Number two, like we saw at the Pakistan example, what happens inside one country in South Asia, other political leaders learn yeah. very, very ugly lessons. Yeah. And I think we've seen that. So basically, um, today we see what uh, was used before partition by uh, the Muslim League for Pakistan, that Islam was in danger. Today we see this concept of that Hindu identity is in danger in India. So that is the basic uh, concept. Of, um, that, sorry, go ahead. 
No, that's it. Yeah. No, that actually reminds me of um, another essay in this book uh, by Gehan uh, Gunatilaka um, on Sri Lanka. And he talks about how just because you are a religious mi- majority in that particular state, you might be, you would still be part of a global minority. And he's talking about the Sinhala Buddhists and Sinhalese Buddhists. Um, but I also think he brings up an interesting point, which I think is applicable across South Asia, which is the cyclical nature of antagonism and violence. Can you tell us a bit more about this push and pull that happens? Um, there is a push and pull which we have seen, and as I've described, it has changing faces mm-hmm. to how it occurs. Um, but at the moment, where I see my see things going, and the reason I felt it was so important to um, put this book together is I see. South Asia, and I see a lot of other parts of the world going very fast with the lynchings, with the legislation, with the hate politics, with the dehumanization that is taking place to pre-World War Europe and pre-partition subcontinent. So yes, Gehan is correct that there are stages and phases as we've seen in every country. But right now, I think that all the excellent contributors who have contributed essays to this in different ways have brought together the fact that there is a gathering storm today. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's linked to the developing economies of South Asia, like perhaps competition over resources, economic insecurity, perhaps even a propensity for populism? It's definitely populism, because I'll tell you, for example, Bangladesh has a very strong economy and a tiny minority, negligible, I would say, um, uh, of um, Hindus primarily, but now their attacks on Ahmadi Muslims and Mm -hmm. other you know, communities which are even in the thousands. Yeah. Um, India, on the other hand, yes, COVID was a tough time, but India, by and large, is an economy on the move, as we've seen with President Biden and President Modi meeting, mm-hmm. its importance geostrategically, mm-hmm. um, its importance as a market and a country that sells to big markets. Pakistan, on the other hand, is where Sri Lanka was. Its economy is close to collapse. So I know in South Asia, we always like to say, is there an underpinning of the economy? Is there something else? Because it's not natural. We were an area of the world that was the most pluralist, that had the most faiths, that had, you know, but what we're seeing right now is, These countries are very different economically. Mm -hmm. They're very different in how the institutions are built up. Mm -hmm. For example, in India, you had incredibly strong institutions. Mm -hmm. And yet today we see the CAA, right? We see Love Jihad. We saw Corona Jihad. And one of the, I think, chapters that is important to read on that is Mayami Chandani's essay on the role of the media, especially social media. And what we have seen with, I will not name, but various, you know, how business people, we saw it with Murdoch, et cetera, in the West. Maybe three decades ago, we are seeing the same thing happen today in India and Pakistan. So the media was a very big part, if you remember, of Hitler's um, propaganda machine. Um, So, uh, you know, I'm just seeing gathering forces coming together and I really felt people need to read this. People need to think about this outside our own boxes, which is why I didn't choose all academics Mm -hmm. or all practitioners. Mm -hmm. They were not all household names, you know, Vantana, but these were people who've been working on something particularly maybe in their little corner Mm. and some who have been on this, you know, public stage. Mm -hmm. But it's it's an important time in our history. 
Absolutely. I actually was going to ask you about Mayami Chandani's essay next, because I do want to talk about the role that social media plays um, in building this intolerance. Um, in her essay, she kind of talks about the changing media ecosystem in India and how um, all the disinformation that's been spreading has kind of led to the rise of a new generation of journalists, fact checkers, um, who essentially um, work on social media. So how do you see social media influencing this kind of intolerance? Do you, do you think it can also be a change for good? You know, you see um, individuals trying to work on social media as a source of good. And you and I both know who those people are, and we try very hard. But, you know, I first experienced this in Pakistan firsthand when dealing with uh, the case of Asia Bibi and uh, the blasphemy laws, etc., And the kind of hate that was targeted at myself, at Salman Tassir, God bless him, um, my colleague, Minister Shabazz Bhatti, who was also assassinated, the way these um, extremist political groups now, religious slash political, because they're not purely religious, right? they're religious political groups, have captured the internet and have captured, whether it's Twitter, now they're using TikTok, they're mm-hmm. using Instagram. Mm-hmm. So they're getting Facebook. at young people. But you see, Facebook is an older market, perhaps, in some ways. But with TikTok, they're getting a lot of teenagers who normally would be looking for makeup tips. Right. But they're getting in there and they're shaping their brains to hate right. the other, to fear the other. Mm-hmm. And the other the authorization of people who are your own citizens, who have lived side by side all these generations. So, um, you know, I I think Maya's piece is a very strong piece because she's been within um, that world for a very long time. Yeah, and has been studying it and teaches it, teaches about it as well. Um, do we see this intolerance? Um, I mean, you touched upon this before, but do we see this intolerance spilling into our South Asian neighbors like Nepal or Bhutan? I have, you know, Nepal and Bhutan, I don't think I have the stage yet, but just like, you know, again, coming back to Pakistan, it took 70 years. And it took really Zia al Haq, one mm-hmm. particular polarizing political figure who was all powerful at that time, right? Um, so it's not impossible, even though they have very small minorities in Nepal and Bhutan. But once this fire started in Pakistan, I was talking about this 10 years ago, Vandana. Yeah. That it crosses borders. Yeah. Hate is so much easier to sell. Yeah. And once people learn those techniques, you know, watching uh, Sipai Saba or Terry Kelebek, Pakistan, you then see groups, similar groups in India yeah. that um, were not violent before, are now watching the lynch mobs in Pakistan with blasphemy victims. And they're starting to recreate a lot of those same uh, patterns of behavior. It's like a playbook. Violence and, yeah. speech, violence and speech, violence and action, and creating this terrible fear of a minority that cannot have more babies and outnumber you, that cannot economically take you on, That, but it's all a vote-gathering machine. Mm-hmm. Pakistan is virtually... I would say 98% Muslim. And yet in the last few days, we have seen the desecration of Ahmadi mosques. We have seen blasphemy victims pulled out of a jail, beaten to death with poles and by people's feet and burnt alive in the name of God. So it's a very frightening God, but the way they're using God to politicize and create long political stays in power. 
if you were talking about the rest of the world, say, I'll just give the example of Israel, for example. Right. What Mr. Netanyahu has perfected in Israel and what some Israelis are saying is we've been through the Holocaust and you are using those same, exactly those same levers mm-hmm. for to create the other. Pressing right. those buttons, yeah. Exactly. Um, how do we, I know this is a big question, but how do we build solidarity across South Asia? Well, we built solidarity by, I think, forcing, forcing, um, you know, liberal political parties not to go the Pakistan way, where they themselves were involved with making the blasphemy law even harsher just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Political parties who you would think would be the future of Pakistan. So... I would say to other countries in the region, you know, get behind political figures who you think will have a more positive voice, who see us as number one citizens of the world, see us all as citizens of our country, see us all as humans, Mm -hmm. because the dehumanization of the Mm -hmm. other only the dehumanization can lead you to a point where you can burn a human being alive. That's not a natural phenomenon. No, so not. I would just say it's nice to say about human rights groups. It's nice to talk about civil society. All those things are important, but they must get into the political process because as the title of my book says, it yeah. is the politics of hate. So it has to be defeated in that field. Right. Um, This this brings me to my last question. As the editor of this volume, um, which was your favorite essay to work on? And also, what were the issues um, that didn't make the cut? The issues that didn't make the cut, um, there were so many. But I tried to stay away from things that were ripped from the headlines. Because people are reading about those, you know, so I all the contributors, I ask them to take a deeper dive mm. and to write about something they personally knew, which is why, except for one co-written essay, mm-hmm. they're all I written by South Asians and they're all written by people from all of us. This is not a book written by Americans sitting somewhere else because we know right? So so what didn't make the cut? Um, I tried not to, I tried to keep the book. Um, Each essay tells its own tale. I I obviously talk about parliament and laws and the constitution of Pakistan because that's where it all went wrong. But I tried to not dictate too much to my contributors. I told them, write what you know the best and what's closest to your heart, because that's always, always the most effective. So you will see the chapter on the Christians of Pakistan, written by a former um, um, bishop of the Church of England. Um, He's taken a very different turn in that, but he brings Christianity back to St. Thomas. Why does he do that? He does that, even though it's about Christians in Pakistan, because we Christians are not new. Christians are not in India or Pakistan because of the British. This is not about the colonial power. Yeah. We are all in the subcontinent, in the greater subcontinent, because we are children of the greater God, not the lesser God, I would say. Yeah. That's beautifully put. Um, do you have a favorite essay or one a piece that you and personally enjoyed working on? You know, the one we haven't talked about, which maybe uh, to you was not that um, compelling, or maybe it was, but I found Dr. Thaki's piece on Shias in Pakistan fascinating because no one has done work like that before. And the interesting thing about when he wrote this, he never writes about religion. 
He writes about political movement. Right after he wrote this, the Pakistani parliament passed the amendment to the blasphemy law, basically making Shia Muslims much more targeted by the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. Mm. So, you know, in a way, he foresaw what was coming. Right. Yeah. That was one. Uh, Mayas was one. I thought uh, Niranjan Sahu wrote a very, very complex, uh, you know, but essay. Succinct, yeah. Very simple, you know, and that anyone, and the reason I did an edited book, sometimes it's hell, corralling all these different cats okay. with different obligations and different personalities. Some days I was saying, Vandana, why didn't you write the book myself? But you know, there's a uniqueness to each voice. Yeah. So um, I'm so grateful to all of them. And I and I think there's a richness. And mm -hmm. I think the time is now, Vandana. And I also did essays because they're short. Someone can pick up one essay that interests them. Yeah. And hopefully start thinking about what we're facing today. Yeah. In no, South absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, each essay, even though they're themed around the same topic, yeah. each essay provides such rich insight into such a different facet of South Asia. Um, it was it was a great read, <laughs> even though troubling. Um, but thank you so much uh, for putting this out there. Thank you. On a last note, I must thank Ali Riaz, who is the foremost scholar on Bangladesh for bringing together the secular and the non-secular attacks on Bangladesh today on the fabric, which is actually also a very fascinating read. Vandana, it's been such a pleasure to talk to, and I hope one day we will be able to meet uh, in person. Thank you so much. I see people like you, young people, and you're my hope, because I was there once, but <laughs> I'm now, uh, you know, um, I can be a truth teller, but I can't be a player in the way that all of you are. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you and it was a pleasure reading your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.